Hello, I'm Dr. Brian Cole, and over the next few minutes, I will present the management of the symptomatic articular cartilage defect. One thing to understand is that these defects are very common. They do tend to be more common in highly active individuals. We know that the MRI can often under or overrepresent the nature of these articular cartilage lesions. And we also know that we have a very poor understanding of the natural history of said defects. There's an abundance of data that states that the level of activities do not necessarily correlate with the disease progression. So it's important to educate our patients that despite having a known articular cartilage problem, in the absence of sufficient symptoms, we will often allow them to continue to play actively in sports. It is also important to understand that the concept of skillful neglect, where this, this quote by Voltaire, the art of medicine consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease, holds well, true for a lot of our patients because we see their symptoms may oscillate over time, may or may not be related to the level of activity, and often if patients can tolerate the level of discomfort, we allow them to continue to be active. Now, athletes have very unique considerations. It's important to help them understand how to separate the concern for their problem from the actual disability that they have. In some instances, an articular cartilage defect in their care may be related to the inability to perform, which actually may make them unemployable. The treatment chosen may actually affect their asset value, and we do very well in improving their activities of daily living with proper indications, but we do less well in the predictable return to sport. It's also important to match the solution that we choose to the anticipated outcome that is desired and to the timeline that is required that the patient actually has at hand. It is important to choose solutions that will not burn bridges for future treatment. When assessing an individual's relative risk, the past often predicts the future in terms of how well they did over the previous year, for example, and their ability to have a sustainable outcome moving forward. Non-surgical treatment is generally reserved for those with like, the acute onset of symptoms where their performance is maintained or if their performance is compromised, they're actually playing for something. Operative treatment is usually for those patients who have failed non-surgical treatment where their performance is impaired and they have the, the runway in terms of time to actually get better. We've learned that older patients, even with the same types of defect, may not behave or respond as, our, as do our younger patients simply because their physiology may be more advanced and they actually may look and feel and behave more like an arthritic patient than a young patient with an articular cartilage defect. The concept of load is also very important. BMI, malalignment, and weakness can also contribute to symptoms. And it's led to this understanding that while we've always focused on the articular cartilage, it is actually the bone and the load that the bone sees which may matter most. Today, we have a number of options to treat patients, including debridement, marrow stimulation, allograft surface treatments, osteochondral autographs, autologous chondrocyte implantation, and osteochondral allograft transplantation. The numbers shown here are the frequency in the United States with which these, these particular treatments are deployed. The algorithm has become very complex and evolved over time. We used to speak of it in terms of management of tibial femoral lesions versus management of patellofemoral lesions. We also speak of it in terms of defect size, in terms of which technology is best or most appropriate based upon that size. In addition, we look at relative demand levels of the patients. The bereavement may be just fine for our simple uh, problems that uh, are lower demand patients versus high demand patients, where any procedure other than complete reconstruction with an osteochondral allograft would otherwise render that patient less symptomatic. We've shown that debridement can be incredibly effective in reducing a patient's symptoms. It can render a defect relatively um, um, irrelevant just by helping the normal cartilage shoulder the load. This is an example of a high-level athlete with a patella defect that underwent simple debridement in violation of the calcified layer in order to induce some fibrocartilage fill, but the patient achieved immediate pain relief because of the debridement. This is still a very viable option. Marrow stimulation is still commonly utilized and is associated with high levels of return to sport, as you see here. The technique has evolved to drilling over the use of a traditional awl. It leads to less impaction and, and subcondyl bone response with load. We showed that the, the outcomes as well as the re revision rates were far better when patients had drilling done versus the use of a traditional microfracture awl. This is another high-level individual with a long, narrow defect that we felt would not respond to marrow stimulation, excuse me, would not respond to articular cartilage debridement, 
but believed that in order for that patient to become symptom-free, we would perform a marrow stimulation using drilling, which successfully got him back to high-level play. Now, there are a number of ways to improve the outcomes of marrow stimulation, including the use of orthobiologics, collagen scaffolds, and cell-based repair using minced autologous cartilage and allogeneic tissue. Minced autologous cartilage, or the autocar procedure, is what you see here. This is a technique whereby we obtain cartilage from the intercondylar notch. We capture it in this device called a graft net, and we may combine it with allogeneic tissue such as allogeneic cartilage or biocartilage, as well as a signal such as PRP or bone marrow concentrate. This is another example of said procedure. The cartilage is obtained from the intercondylar notch. The defect is arthroscopically prepared and drilled. And then we take a combination of bone marrow aspirate concentrate, allogeneic articular cartilage, such as biocartilage. We perform a marrow stimulation and, and inject the, the composite into the defect and then seal it with fibrin glue. An osteochondral autograph procedure is another technique that has been shown to have superior outcomes in similar sized defects in active patients compared to marrow stimulation. Oates' procedure in this patient, who is a high-level basketball player who had a lateral femoral condyle defect and a small tibial lesion, responded favorably to a single-plug osteochondral autograph. Macy is still commonly used in the United States to allow patients to return to sport, but the timeline may be a bit longer. But we've seen similar return to sport rates above 75% in high-level athletes. This is an example of a challenging patient who's relatively young who has a patellofemoral lesion. The patient underwent a tibial tubercle osteotomy along with combined treatment of a bipolar defect of both the patella and the trochlea. Osteochondral allografts are another important option that have had return to sport rates of 75 to 88%. This is an example of a trochlea and femoral condyle lesion that underwent previous marrow stimulation and then underwent revision using a large osteochondral allograft of both the trochlea and the femoral condyle to successfully get this athlete back to play. Finally, it's important to correct all comorbidities like alignment, meniscal deficiency, and instability. When we've looked at our meniscal allograft patients with or without concomitant treatments, we've seen return to sport rates in the range of 75 to 85%. Similarly, osteotomy has been shown to return patients reliably back to high-level activities in the same outcome range. This is a patient who had a large femoral condyle lesion who was in varus, who had a corrective osteotomy as well as an osteochondral allograft at the same time. Another patient who's a professional soccer player, similarly now in valgus, had correction to neutral with an osteochondral allograft. It's critical that patient expectations are properly managed, a good understanding of the results of non-surgical treatment, what leads to a successful outcome, and what is associated with poor outcomes is, is important for us to understand when counseling our patients. I think some of the key takeaways are that there are large incidents of abnormalities that may never cause symptoms in the articular cartilage. Whatever plan we choose must meet the athlete's or individual's expectations in terms of reducing pain and or improving performance, but generally our decisions are not associated with a preventative treatment strategy. Skillful neglect is acceptable in appropriate cases, and in general, we do the least amount necessary to achieve a successful outcome. Thank you very much.